everyone. Thanks for joining us today for this special call with Tony Khan to discuss the upcoming Forbidden Door pay-per-view event this Sunday from the United Center in Chicago. Sunday night's event will feature numerous championship titles on the line and so much more. There's only one person qualified to address everything that awaits Sunday night. So let's just let's get right to it uh, for the next 45 minutes or so with AEW CEO, GM, and head of creative, Tony Khan. I'm going to turn it over to Tony for some opening thoughts. And then we'll open the lines for questions. And I will tell you now that Stu Merrick from 109, oh, I'm sorry, 104.9 and Austin will be the first uh, the first reporter to ask Tony questions. Tony, you're up. Hey, thank you everyone for joining us for the call. I'm very excited for Forbidden Door pay-per-view this weekend. Uh, we're, we've got a hot start to the weekend tonight with one of the hottest episodes of AEW Rampage start to finish that you'll see. It starts out with a great match between Ray Phoenix and Andrade El Idolo, and I promise it's going to end in, in very wild fashion. Nobody's going to want to miss, and it's going to lead right into the countdown to Forbidden Door, and you'll see some of the best interviews in pro wrestling. I think some of the best talkers, some of the best orators in the pro wrestling business are in AEW, and also we're going to hear from some of the top stars in New Japan pro wrestling and what they have to say about the big matches this weekend. Um, this pay-per-view, before I get into any of the questions, I'm sure we'll discuss this. There have been a lot of injuries that have led to some changes, and I think we're fortunate that there are great stars in AEW and New Japan Pro Wrestling to accommodate a lot of this. Uh, there's a lot to look forward to on Sunday's pay-per-view. We'll, we'll preview tonight on Rampage and Countdown on TNT. Uh, 10 p.m. Eastern Rampage, uh, 11 p.m. Eastern Countdown, and uh, and from there, uh, I, I will, I'm sure, discuss some of these injuries throughout the call and different people and their status. Um, I'll try to give respect to those people and how you know their own personal recovery times and and each injury and each person's recovery is a sensitive thing. So I'll I'll, I'll try to be um, careful in what I say about those, but. That being said, I think this is going to be a very compelling partnership between AEW and New Japan Pro Wrestling. Um, when I was a kid, I was very excited about the collaborations between WCW and New Japan Pro Wrestling. And the way I was introduced to pro wrestling in Japan and a lot of the wrestlers there before I watched wrestling that came from Japan was when the wrestlers from New Japan came to WCW. They competed on TBS and later on TNT also. And that's how I became introduced to a lot of the top stars. And now hopefully a new generation of fans will get introduced to some great wrestlers that same way. And with that, uh, we'll take the first question. All right. Thanks, Tony. So as promised, Stu Merrick from 104.9 in Austin is up and on deck will be Connor Casey from Comic Book. Stu? Thank you, Tony. Thanks for doing this for us. Uh, looking forward to a great pay-per-view on Sunday. You mentioned the injuries, uh, and I'll I'll let you get into that a little bit. I want to ask how how hard has it been to do the creative to book this card, given the rash of injuries that has been that has happened both in AEW and in New Japan. Well, it's a great question, and I'll take you back to uh, Double or Nothing, and I thought we were coming off a really strong pay-per-view with, I thought, about as good of a third act as you can have with the final three matches being Anarchy in the Arena and the three-way for the World Tag Team Championship with Jungle Boy and Luchasaurus versus Ricky Starks and Will Hobbs and versus Keith and Swerve and the world title match, CM Punk versus Hangman Page. And coming out of that pay-per-view as hot as it was, I got the schedule from New Japan Pro Wrestling who was going to be available on the date. And it, it was already, in my opinion, challenging to, to book the shows because not all the wrestlers that I wanted to use and all the top New Japan stars were going to be available. And, and some of them weren't going to be available, as you guys saw from now the last few weeks until later. So I had to, to work with the, the wrestlers and their great top, top stars that were going to be coming in and, and primarily people that I wanted to build TV stories and, and get in and on TV of the people that were available to me early on were Tanahashi and Osprey, who are huge stars who are now in very prominent matches on this card with Tanahashi versus Moxley for the AEW Interim World Championship 
and uh, Will Ospreay versus Orange Cassidy, which has been planned for a while. And, and um, so with obviously changes from our original plan of Punk versus Tanahashi and, and now the plan to crown an interim champion coming in, that was, that was different. But to be honest, I was really excited knowing that, okay, Tanahashi is going to be here and I really hold hard to get Osprey in sooner than he might have come otherwise ahead of Dominion rather than wait till after. And then um, knowing that we weren't going to have Jay White till two weeks out and Okada till a week out and Zack Sabre till the, you know, the week of and so forth. I was like, okay, this is what we'll do with what we, and I, I was so excited about what we had and a group of people that I would, you know, run ideas by or listen to any ideas they have and, and the thoughts I care about that work here. You know, a bunch of people are in my house in LA uh, right after we left Vegas and we were went before the forum show and I was running through my ideas and stuff and everybody was loving it. And it was like Sanjay and Pat Buck and QT and Phil, you know, CM Punk. And uh, I was running around uh, calling stuff and everyone was like really into it. And, by the end of it, it was stuff that involved, frankly, Punk and Tanahashi and other people, uh, it was very different. And we, there were a lot of cool things, and I think it could have been really cool. But it's, but what we ended up doing, to be honest, to, to explain it, is with Moxley and Tanahashi, I think it's a story that has years of build. And to be honest, we're very fortunate that it's a match uh, that hadn't happened and that people had wanted to see and frankly both wrestlers really wanted to wrestle each other mox wanted to wrestle tanahashi so bad last year around all out he was building up his kojima match and he did more of a promo on tanahashi than he did on kojima and i was like come on John. like and he ended up having a great match with kojima and then to be honest the twist of the kojima match was not only to have a great match in the all-out pay-per-view that i still think is probably the best thing we've ever done uh, last year on all out and uh, that uh, John have a great match, but also the big twist at the end was Suzuki coming in and setting up John's story with Suzuki building to the Grand Slam main event, uh, which is a great match with John and Eddie versus Archer and Suzuki, which is relevant now with Suzuki and Archer and the whole Suzuki goon thing still being a big part of AEW. So it's a lot of changes. And I took stuff, uh, Some, you know, honestly, Tanahashi moved from being what would have been the CM Punk and FTR and some of the stuff with, you know, probably would have been CM Punk, honestly, instead of Trent in that six man tag uh, with CM Punk and FTR versus Will Ospreay and Aussie open. And then stuff would have gone in a very different direction. And Tanahashi would have been adjacent to that. And Mox has a lot happening in the company and there's a lot of things happening in the blood and guts match. No secret is next week. And uh, we'll announce, um, a, a little stipulation regarding that tonight on Rampage uh, that pertains to Forbidden Door ahead of Blood and Guts. It, it ties them together a little bit more than they already are because we know that Brian Danielson's out. And uh, I'll get to that in a second because I think that deserves its own uh, injury uh, you know, discussion. And so with CM Punk uh, originally would have been attached to that stuff. Tanahashi uh, would have um, been in the – you know, with kind of, I think on TV with him and it would have made, which would have made sense built into their match, which would have meant punk was out there with FTR, which would have meant Will Ospreay and orange Cassidy. And there was a lot of exciting stuff that could have happened, but instead uh, it made a lot of sense to take something that had been there for years and is a match people really do want to see. And, and I have to say with Mox and Tanahashi, like I was saying, uh, it's with years of anticipation. It's a match John's been chasing for years. And uh, that's why it means so much to be able to do it now. And I don't think anybody in pro wrestling has earned the right to be able to do what they want to do. And, and uh, you know, uh, has, has gone through more to, to get to where they are right now than John, because uh, at this time last year, um, I never would have thought, what the next year would hold. I never would have thought he'd be gone. I never would have thought he'd come back. And then for the, the way he did uh, to, to come back looking so physically different and so much mentally healthier, because I, I have always loved John and loved working with him. And, and uh, the, the, the person who's come back has been uh, that much better, that much, 
you know, that much more capable of a, of a pro wrestler. And he's, it's happened at the perfect time for us with all these injuries, the CM Punk and Brian Danielson and on Brian Danielson. Uh, that is just, a, you know, talk about the one, two punch of injuries, losing CM Punk and Brian Danielson, two of the greatest professional wrestlers of all time. And uh, Brian Danielson is so valuable to the company backstage and of course on screen and, and, and most importantly on screen fans were so excited for forbidden door, him wrestling Zack Sabre jr. I think it was the anticipation was there. We had been hoping that we could really start building it up and, and Brian was really start feeling well, I think after anarchy in the arena and when he, when he you know, had any, uh, any doubts whatsoever, I just didn't want to take a chance. And if, if, if he's, not feeling a hundred percent, a hundred percent of the time. There's not any sense in taking any chances. I so uh, I shot him down, and I think it was the right thing to do. And that being said, it it was one of those also perfect situations because rarely do the stars align where you have a mystery opponent and a chance to build up a moment like this. And it's very fitting to go back to the United Center where we've only had one show. And, you know, it was a great moment. And I know for sure we're going to have that great moment. I think there's going to be a lot of great moments I expect on the show. But one thing I know this great moment is when we introduce Zack Sabre Jr.'s mystery opponent. I'm really excited about it. And it, I wish it had happened under different circumstances. And, and to be honest, um, I, I, you know, I'll, I just really can't wait till. CM Punk and Brian Danielson do come back. They're both so valuable to the company, but the circumstances, uh, I I'm, can't say I'm disappointed that we have John Moxley stepping up and there's nobody I'd rather see step up and there's no opponent I'd rather see John step into the ring with than the person he wants to wrestle most in the world, which is Tanahashi. And to have it be under these circumstances where it was supposed to be Punk versus Tanahashi for the world title, now creating an interim world title and, and that situation being John versus Tanahashi and putting bigger stakes on something that means so much to both Moxley and Tanahashi. It means that much to me. And also this mystery opponent, I think it's going to be a great moment. And, and I think it'll be a great match that they will have with Zack Sabre Jr. So I'm very excited for Forbidden Door and, and the injuries have changed a lot. And that's only the tip of the iceberg on injuries. Kyle O'Reilly's injuries changed a lot of the card. Um, but Ishii being out is, uh, is very unfortunate that he had to forfeit it, the New Japan tournament that he won. Um, and, you know, it's, it's changed a lot, but I think that we're very fortunate that our companies have a lot of great wrestlers that have stepped up to fill these spots and that there's been a lot of build to the matches that are happening that, like Boxley versus Tanahashi is a great example that before Forbidden Door ever happened at the match, I think fans have wanted to see. And, of course, uh, to get Jericho and Eddie Kingston, anytime you see Jericho and Eddie Kingston uh, in the same place, that's exciting. And, and ahead of Forbidden Door this weekend, Jericho and Eddie Kingston will both be on Rampage tonight. Uh, Eddie Kingston will hear from him, and Jericho is the host of the show. And anytime they're in the same building, you know things could get crazy. So uh, watch out for that on Rampage ahead of the countdown to Forbidden Door. That is a lot, but but there's a lot of injuries and there's been a lot of things going into the show so i figured that would come up so i'm glad you asked it right off the tops too so thanks for that and that's hopefully the fill on injuries and some of the changes so thanks, that's, that's my long answer thanks jim <laughs> thanks dude thanks tony um okay next up is connor casey from comic book and connor will be uh followed by jay shell nicole from inclusive creations connor great Hey, Tony, appreciate you doing this today. Um, following up on that subject of injuries, obviously your focus is directed fully on this weekend. But in the back of your mind, are you thinking about what a Forbidden Door 2 event looks like with all of your big players being available? Yes, absolutely. I've thought a lot about it. And um, we've already discussed the possibilities of Forbidden Door 2 based on the success already we've had from this event selling well over a million dollars in tickets. And uh, they're now, because we've opened up some seats with the, the cool stage we've put in, I think we can get more fans in. So there are a few seats left in Chicago, but it was sold out and we've, we've opened up more seats, but they're going quickly. 
So I don't know. I, I think it's been so successful of an event that we have to plan to do it again. I think a sequel is to be expected and, and it would be great to get some of those wrestlers back, but who knows next year, you can always have people get injured. So I, I, to me, what we have right now is so special because there are one of the, here's some, here's a dilemma in wrestling. I'll tell I'll give you a thought. There's so many stars in pro wrestling right now and between the two companies and it's fascinating. WWE had an interesting approach to it, to be honest. I don't think it's something anybody in AEW besides me has ever entertained, but I see it's, it's not only lucrative business wise, but there's so many stars in AEW and, and frankly there too, they've had they have people that they thought they had enough people to do two nights of, of a show. And, and now Russell Kingdom's gone to two nights. We've never done anything like that, but you, all told me you know, that uh, I, I try to pack a lot in, in four hours and, and plus in a pay-per-view. So I get there's so many people, it's hard to do, get all the stars in. What we have is we are very fortunate. I have so many wrestlers in AEW. We'll have no trouble putting on a great show. The trouble, the harder thing in AEW is honestly getting um, all the stars in, in because we have so many great wrestlers here. So the depth is there. This is why we have so many great stars in the company is when you have injuries, people being out. We saw during the pandemic how it pays off to have a deep roster and the roster is twice as deep now as it was then. And so, uh, and to be honest, probably more than twice as deep. So uh, I think we're, we're really well equipped to deal with it. And now it's come out where the card is something that wrestling fans all over the world are very excited about. And that's why I'm so excited and I you know, feel pretty good right now honestly especially compared to what i did when i talked to danielson on the weekend and and uh and realized we were probably going to make a change and then i had to start planning that now i feel pretty good about where we're at i think it's all come together pretty great and uh i think rampage tonight will be a great way to go into the pay-per-view for and hopefully we'll do many forbidden doors going forward based on the success of this one thanks connor thanks connor Okay, Jay Shell Nicole of Inclusive Creations, you're up next. And Jay Shell, I will follow your question and Tony's response with a write in from Trevor Robb of Post Media. Jay Shell? Hi, Tony. My name is Jay Shell. I'm representing SE Scoops, Russell Purist, and the Late Night Grin. And I wanted to ask a little bit about the buy in at uh, Revolution. There were three matches on the buy-in. Is there a reason in particular that you decided to return to the one buy-in match instead of keeping the three-match mold? Um. Well, I actually am going to announce more matches on Rampage tonight, so it's a great question, but I have plans to do a little bit more on Rampage tonight, and so we'll, we'll announce a little bit more for the buy-in tonight. Uh, I am going to have uh, not you know, there won't be a million matches or anything like that, but there'll be a little bit more on the buy-in than what we've already announced. The, the pay-per-view card is, I think, the nine matches that people know about right now. And there's one match announced for the buy-in, but I will be doing a little bit more um, as I finalize plans with New Japan, and they'll involve wrestlers from New Japan also. Very good. Thanks, Jishel. <clears throat> okay, here's the... Here's a question from Trevor Robb of Post Media, and we're going to follow Trevor with Amy Nemedy from WrestleJoy. Tony, Trevor has the following question. Following up on the Canadian press story regarding AEW's plans to come to Canada, I'm curious how Alberta fits into those plans to potentially bring Dynamite slash Rampage to Edmonton and Calgary. And as a follow, what is your knowledge of the Alberta wrestling scene, Stampede Wrestling, for instance? Thank you. What a great question. I named some cities, and to be honest, I named cities based on some wrestlers that AEW has stars competing here that, that where they hail from. So, so, you know, that includes a lot of great wrestlers from around Toronto and Hamilton, and, and I will get to Alberta here in a second because I have extensive thoughts on it, as you all can imagine. Uh, and uh, Delta, uh, British Columbia, which is around uh, Vancouver, Kyle O'Reilly uh, from the Vancouver area. I neglected to mention Montreal, which is a legendary wrestling city, and I should have said it uh, when I, and it was an omission by me that I did not mean to make, but I was just naming cities uh, off the top of my head uh, on a long day. But uh, I have to say, uh, when it when it comes to Alberta, Calgary and Edmonton would both be great homes for an AEW event. Uh, we've worked very closely with Dr. Martha Hart and the Owen Hart Foundation, 
And it was a real honor to have Dr. Martha Hart and Oge Hart and Athena Hart here in AEW representing Owen Hart's legacy and the Owen Hart tournament. And we crowned great winners and had a great tournament with a lot of great matches and great qualifiers. And I look forward to continuing working with the Owen Hart Foundation. It was just a real pleasure to have Dr. Martha Hart working with us. And in the past also, uh, speaking of Calgary and, and wrestling, I don't, I think the conversation uh, has to, has to have Brett the Hitman Hart, arguably the greatest pro wrestler of all time. And of course he's from Calgary and he's the very first person ever to hold the AEW world championship belt in his hands out on pay-per-view uh, on our very first show, double or nothing 2019. And, uh, there's a lot of great wrestlers here in AEW. I have a lot of respect for him, and I have a lot of respect for Brett. I think he's just a tremendous person. I really like him a lot, and not in addition to respecting him as one of the best people to ever lace up the boots and one of the best people to ever work in pro wrestling and somebody who's been really good to not only the pro wrestling business by making a lot of money and, and helping, you know, create a lot of box office for the business, but also has been really good to the wrestling fans. It has been really good to his fellow wrestlers and uh, Brett, the Hitman Hart, heart um, is somebody that's still very much in the conversation in AEW today, even though he's not somebody that actually wrestles here or competes here. And that is a, I think a testament to his enduring legacy. And so uh, in addition to the, the Hart family and, and many other great uh, wrestlers that have been trained by the hearts, I think uh, Chris Jericho has competed extensively in Alberta and, and uh, Winnipeg is a city, of course, we mentioned earlier that I, I probably, sh I think I mentioned when I was in Canada, I didn't say it just now, but of course, with, I, it's one of the first cities you have to mention in AEW with Chris Jericho and Kenny Omega coming from there uh, and them being two of the great world champions in AEW and two of the great Canadian stars and also two of the great stars in all the world of wrestling with Jericho and Omega. And I think uh, Jericho has competed extensively in Alberta. I know uh, we would love to go there. And I think that would be a great place for us to go. I, to be honest, I've been writing AW Dynamite since I was a kid when I was 12 years old for fun. And I think I started doing Rampage in 2011. And uh, when I was in my late 20s, still doing this for fun before it became a job that I love doing. And uh, there, there were many dynamites in the Saddle Dome in Calgary uh, and um, many times went to Edmonton as well. So I, uh, I would love in real life to do that. That would be great. And I think uh, I mentioned it in my press tour the other day, I think actually specifically that with a great wrestling tradition in Calgary, it would be great. But, I, but I'm glad you mentioned Edmonton because that would be another great city where I think AEW could potentially draw very well. So thanks for asking. And I think we have a great partnership with TSN in Canada um, that has uh, given us a lot of visibility in Canada. When I was up there for the first time since uh, before the pandemic, I, it was really the first time I'd been to Canada since AEW had launched, honestly, uh, because the pandemic hit about six months after we started on TV. And I was really impressed how, uh, how well we had gotten over in Canada <laughs> on TSN. So uh, thank you very much for asking. Thank you very much, Trevor. Amy and Emily from WrestleJoy, you are up next. Uh, Niger Chambers from Big Gold Belt Media will follow Amy. Amy, you're up. Hi, Tony. I wanted to talk about Okada's huge AEW debut. It got a huge reaction from the crowd that was there to see it on Dynamite, also on social media. Can you talk a little bit about what the process was like in getting Kazuchika Okada into AEW, as well as setting up this fatal four-way IWGP championship match? And what was your reaction in the back watching his debut on Dynamite? Well, I was uh, really excited to have him there. Uh, it was an honor to, to meet him in person, finally, and it was a huge, huge honor, huge honor to have him on AEW Dynamite. and for him to be making his debut in uh, what is to some extent an AEW ring, I would say, uh, in our collaboration with New Japan and, and hosting this event at the United Center. And it was an honor to have him step into an AEW ring for the first time on AEW Dynamite. Uh, and that 
is something that I've been looking forward to for a long time. I have so much respect for Okada and I've admired him for many, many years. And long before we we launched AEW or I knew I was going to be in the wrestling business and he's still a relatively young man. It shows what a, what a top prospect at a young age he was. And uh, it's going to be great to see him compete. I think fans all over the world can look forward to that match, seeing Okada in the same ring wrestling for the IWGP title, trying to win it back this weekend from Jay White and also having a couple of other great champions from pro wrestling, Adam Cole, who's won titles all over the world and has competed in New Japan Pro Wrestling uh, and is is one of our top stars in AEW. And of course, Hangman Adam Page, the former world champion, one of the top stars in AEW, also a former world tag team champion here and somebody who's, who's been a winner in Ring of Honor and, and also won a lot of matches in New Japan Pro Wrestling himself and dreamed of winning that IWGP title for a long time. Would I have liked to have had all the people involved on TV longer? Yes. Uh, that was one of the challenges I knew I was going to face going in that, uh, not, not honestly a while back. I didn't know that I was hoping we could get Okada in sooner, but then when I started to get into when people were going to be available and how, you know, planning the TV, um, I found out he wasn't coming till the week before. And, uh, I had to deal with it and I've had to deal with it. So, uh, I, I would honestly would have loved to have had him here sooner, but, uh, it was great to have him when he came and it talk about, uh, coming at the right time because we could use him <laughs> and we had a lot of a lot of people out and it was it was a night where uh brian danielson delivered uh good news and bad news the bad news being that he's not going to be able to wrestle in blood and guts and forbidden door but the good news being that it, you know there is somebody coming that is going to be a, a very 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 qualified replacement and there are very few people that people would want to see step into brian danielson's shoes and wrestle against Zack Saber Jr. on Sunday night at Forbidden Door and fight against Chris Jericho and those sports entertainers on Wednesday night in the blood and guts. But there is one person out there that we were able to get to come and, and I'm really excited for it. So uh, now it was, it was a, a night where I think there were going to be people wanted to see what was going to happen going into Forbidden Door. And so I was glad we were able to get him here when we did. And uh, he's, one of the best wrestlers in the world and a lot of the best wrestlers in the world are going to be on this pay-per-view, which is the story of the show. I don't think the story should be that, uh, you know, some of the best wrestlers are out because what's crazy is how many wrestlers are in and what the show is. And, and hopefully in the future it can build to more, more great shows, but it's all going to start with this one. History is going to be made at the United center. Okada is there to be a huge part of it. And now that there's, a cloud of mystery over the event too, which is exciting. And, uh, I loved having him there. He, uh, for fun, he must've told me 17 times. He's a Manchester city fan. And, uh, so, uh, I, I, uh, I, by now I get it. Oh God, you like Manchester city, <laughs> but, uh, but I'm excited about following the premier league. He's, uh, he's great. And, uh, I really liked hanging out with him. And, um, uh, I know, uh, I'll be, I'll be talking to him around when, Fulham plays Man City, um, which is a tough game. I think that's the toughest game in the business, honestly. So, um, you know, he'll he'll be letting me know what he thinks about that one. So I hope Fulham can can get a good result there. But I, to be, I always want Fulham to get a good result. But that's one where uh, now I have I'd love to have some bragging rights with Okada, especially against you know arguably the best football club in the world. Uh, so that, it was great to have him here. I would have loved to have had him sooner, I guess, <laughs> is, is, was my, is one of my thoughts. But I, to be honest, when you're, you're, I'm, we're fortunate to have him at all. He's probably uh, on the Mount Rushmore of the best wrestlers in, on the planet. And uh, he's, he's a special person, too. I like him a lot now that I've gotten to know him. Thanks for asking. Thanks, Amy. <clears throat> Niger Chambers from Big Gold Belt Media. You are up next, and I will follow Niger with a question on the right end uh, from Kenny McIntosh from Inside the Ropes. Niger? Hey, Tony, how's it going today? Good. Thanks for asking. How are you? Good, good. So I wanted to know, um, how was the preparation going into this event, and was it, you know, any different from any – uh, you know, standard AEW pay-per-view. And this is in regards to, you know, withholding New Japan Pro Wrestling traditions and whatnot. 
I mean, and also sure. quickly, just to add to that, um, did you ever consider possibly a global press conference, sort of a simulcasting of a, of that uh, across the pond, something that seems to, to be, you know, fitting for such a big event? Uh, well, uh, I, I'm excited to talk to all of you from around the world. And uh, I think, and hopefully, you know, something like that would be possible. I'm on site in Chicago now, and I think people are traveling in for the event. Uh, but I, I was excited to engage with all, all of you today to discuss that. And uh, so I, I, it's a good question. I think I don't want to rehash and give uh, – it's funny because everyone's on mute, but I'm trying to imagine all your reactions, and, and I hope I'm popping you, uh, that I wouldn't want to give the same 20-minute answer I gave at the beginning <laughs> about all of the obstacles and, uh, and, and what we've gone through and changing stuff. But philosophically, I mean, it's been unlike anything I've ever done. I've imagined what it would be like collaborating. I've done, I've had smidgens of it, never on a whole show. This is on, this is like uh, having, you know, have had a bite of pie before and then going out and eating an entire pie. <laughs> and uh, I have the bite of pie was delicious and, and an entire pie is delicious too, but you got to be careful how you eat it <laughs> and, uh, and, and uh, not all at once. And uh, I think for me, uh, that's been planning it out. And uh, it's been the amount of work that's gone into this event and the logistics and, and changes we've had to make. It's been, it's been a lot, but I have a lot of respect for Ghetto and Rocky Romero has been an amazing intermediary working between us. And uh, the three of us have a, have a good thing going, I think. Uh, that being said, it's been unlike anything I've ever done. I have worked with them before for about over a year now since uh, around when uh, Eugene Nagata came in and wrestled on dynamite and we started doing things together more. And, uh, you know, uh, Rocky came in and, and I reunited Rapungi vice as I made very clear in uh, a promo I did around that time. And, uh, but, but, but in all seriousness, we just, had, you know, I've had a lot of fun doing it in TV angles, maybe one match here and there. So a couple people from AEW go to new Japan, one or two people from there came here and it's led to doing a whole show together and it's great because it's it's more revenue for both companies it's already produced seven figures in revenue and and i think it's a great partnership and it has had a lot of challenges i've done stuff like this with them a little bit and with uh triple a for example when we first launched we didn't when we launched there are no championships yet we hadn't crowned champions we just started up so to have a championship match in the first show we had the olympic the eliminator aspect that you know hangman winning the casino battle royale and jericho uh, winning the main event set up them wrestling in the main event of all out for the title but we didn't actually have any championship matches with a belt on the line and i wanted to have some belts to be honest with you and i wanted a championship stakes it just uh thought it would add a lot to the show so uh put together something with conan and he really liked it and that worked out well for triple a and for us and so I have done stuff in the past with companies and, and a lot of stuff with New Japan, but never a whole show and all the build to the show. And um, so there were challenges, but I tried to do the best I could with RTV because, you know, I have to put stuff into RTV. And I think it was, uh, I think they saw now how, the, you know, you have to get the people on the American TV building this stuff. That's why I, I really got, wanted to get Will Ospreay in when I, he came because I was like, if he doesn't, if, you know, Tanahashi, okay, but it was great. Like, that is huge. That is, that checks off one major star that we need. But, uh, you know, we need another major star to build stuff. So before Dominion, I really pulled to get either Okada or Osprey or, or Jay White, one of the big, st and, and Osprey coming in made a lot of sense. And then with that, we put together a lot of stuff. Then CM Punk got hurt and it changed completely. And Brian Danielson was questionable and that was different. And I kind of had to make a lot of changes that I think I talked about a lot at the beginning, but um, it, it's, so it's between working with another company and, and having to be sensitive to stuff that they're dealing with and while planning a kick-ass card and also having had some of the greatest wrestlers of all time, more than one, go out with an injury uh, and then losing some other great wrestlers uh, for, for various other reasons that a wide variety of them. Uh, it's been a lot. So uh, 
I think I, I was, I just know I was really relieved. And uh, when it, when it's all come together, when we finally got Okada and all the great stars in, it's, you know, now that you see it, it's pretty impressive. They have a lot of great wrestlers and we have a lot of great wrestlers. And I think the card is pretty strong. So I'm, I'm very excited for Sunday and I'm excited for tonight too. Uh, it's been, it's been different. And one of the challenges is the politics. I mentioned uh, AAA and New Japan, and they don't really work together. So tonight uh, on Rampage, you're going to see one of the best TV matches out there. And, and it's a pay-per-view quality match, but because of the politics of pro wrestling, it didn't make sense for this pay-per-view necessarily, but that's that's okay. And I, I like everyone involved, and even if they don't work with each other. And so they're all cool with me. And to me, I thought it would be a really great thing for the fans going into an awesome weekend of wrestling and also for the, both the wrestlers involved to have Ray Phoenix versus Andrade El Idolo. Give them the opening, a rampage, which they have tonight. It's going to be 9 o'clock Central here in the Midwest and 10 o'clock Eastern or 10 o'clock Pacific on TNT West. And, and I think Andrade and Ray Phoenix are going to tear the house down to start the show. And I promise a wild end to the show leading into the countdown. And uh, so that you know, that's another aspect of it that there's some wrestlers I wanted to use that you can't use necessarily because it doesn't make sense in a partnership when the people that you're using are also partnered with another company that they don't partner with. <laughs> so, uh, it's, it's a lot, but, uh, it, I think it's going to make for a great weekend of wrestling for the fans. That being said, I, this is, there's probably going to be more great matches in the next, uh, you know, 48 to 72 hours, uh, than, we've had in, in a while. So I'm, I'm excited. Thanks, Niger. <clears throat> okay, here's a, here's a question, Tony, from uh, Kenny, Kenny McIntosh of Inside the Ropes. Is there any part of Forbidden Door being a month away or a month after Double or Nothing that's sort of a test to see how it performs on pay-per-view uh, to perhaps increasing the number of AEW pay-per-views from from four to nine, 10 or whatever, or monthly, whatever that may look like. Is this sort of a, a test run? I don't see it as that. No, I saw it as the opportunity, honestly, when New Japan had availability and, and it worked as a pay-per-view date where uh, it's, I, I believe, the biggest event in sports that'll be on where the people are going to want to watch. And I think it'll it'll be uh, a very interesting to see how it fares, but I think it's a partnership between AEW and New Japan. And that meant finding dates where we could get stars from New Japan to come. And it was already, as you can see, as I've, as I've belabored and, and elaborated on uh, that. It's, you know, challenging to get when they have a promotion, they're running in Japan to get a lot of their stars here on our TV, which we need to build the pay-per-view here, not only in America, but around the world, because Dynamite is on in 130 countries around the world now, and Dynamite and Rampage are on all over the world, and there's huge markets for pay-per-view and other revenue streams where we need to get their wrestlers on TV in AEW if they're going to be marketable in, you know, truly uh, tapping into the potential that they have for the marketability so yeah, i think it's been really good for the audience to get to see uh, tanahashi in a great ma main event here and, and get to see what a big deal he is and and hear the great jr putting over what, how big of a deal it is to have tanahashi on our tv in these weeks and then to, to give the same credibility to okada and will osprey will osprey has been here for a few weeks and has also been involved in three great matches and uh that is not a coincidence because Will Osprey has great matches. He, I, I first met him in 2018 when I was living in England. First time I met Will Osprey and Zack Sabre. Uh, and uh, I have tons of respect for both of them. And uh, Zack Sabre, of course, hasn't actually wrestled. His first appearance was this week. He just got here. But, but Will Osprey has been on our TV for a few weeks now. He's been having tremendous matches. And, and it's a testament to him and what a great wrestler he is and now what a great champion he is. And one of the uh, biggest draws in AEW and one of the definitely the most underrated grapplers is Orange Cassidy. And I know there'll be tons of eyeballs on that match. And Orange Cassidy's a huge star for AEW and, and he 
you know, he doesn't get excited about many things, but to be honest, he does get excited about New Japan Pro Wrestling or as excited as Orange Cassidy can get. And he would be a, a great, great U.S. champion for New Japan Pro Wrestling. And, and as you've seen with John Moxley and Lance Archer and, and other people from AEW carrying titles in New Japan, that's something I am open to. So I think uh, he would be a great champion for them. And I think that Will Ospreay versus Orange Cassidy could tear the house down. And uh, so, yeah, it's, 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 it's not an AEW exactly you know it's not exactly like a regular AEW pay-per-view it's, it is an AEW show but it's not at the same time because we have new japan is so prominently involved and and uh it's a collaboration and i it we ha- in doing so i think this is a date that worked for them but also where i thought it was far enough out from double or nothing uh where it could make sense on the pay-per-view calendar and now also you have to remember i'm also in the pay-per-view business with ring of honor and uh, that's another consideration. But with, for AEW, we built up four great events that all have had not only great audience, but have grown year over year. All four of them have grown year over year every single time. That That is one of the best streaks we have going in AEW. Probably the single greatest streak is every pay-per-view has grown year over year. It'll be a challenge all out. And I really believe we can do it. And And it's all building to that, to the biggest card we can do. Because the biggest card we ever did, the biggest pay, you know, the biggest payday we've ever had, the biggest um, day for our company ever was all out 2021. And I think to keep the streak going, that means we have to top that. And this show is a huge, huge milestone because it's the first new event we've created in years in, on pay-per-view. We've, I've not tried to oversaturate that market, but it was something the fans called for. I never wanted to do a pay-per-view and have people not excited for it. This was something the fans for years had called for. And when we said we had a big announcement, the fans were calling for this. This is one of the announcements that they really wanted to see. I think this was something on the list of dream announcements. Certainly, if there was a, a top five or a, or a top four Mount Rushmore, as we say, uh, then it, this would, would have been on them. This is something fans for a long time have been calling for, a partnership between AEW and New Japan on a pay-per-view, which is now this Sunday. is finally happening just over 48 hours from this phone call uh, here in Chicago, Forbidden Door. Thank you, uh, Kenny, for your write-in. I have another write-in uh, from Lucas Sharpio from VL Media in France. And after you answer Lucas, uh, I'd like to make sure that Sean Radican from Pro Wrestling Torch will be ready. Tony, here's, uh, here's Lucas's question. On Sunday, AEW will crown an interim AEW world champion due to CM Punk's injury, which was announced a few weeks ago. Could you tell us the reason behind your choice of crowning an interim champion instead of vacating Punk's title? Uh, We'll use the interim championship in the past to create a unification match. And we've had exciting results in the past and had, and I think it's how other major sports have, designed their uh championship to be defended in in these cases where the champion is not able to come in and fight right away so in boxing and ufc i've seen great champions you know with injuries or situations where they couldn't get to the fight so they crowned an interim champion and it's been very effective and it's been effective for aw too and I think it's an opportunity to have a great championship match and set up a unification fight where the winner of Tanahashi versus Moxley can then go on and have a, a match versus CM Punk. And either way, it would be a great dream match. And I, I, I'm i very excited about this match, Moxley versus Tanahashi, which is a match fans have looked forward to all over the world for a long time. But... I think, all, you know, then to have on top of that two great possibilities, two dream matches that we could look forward to where CM Punk wrestles in a unification match, I think that's really exciting. Lucas, we appreciate the question. <clears throat> Sean Radican from Pro Wrestling Torch is up next. Sean will be followed by Mike Johnson from PW Insider. Sean? Hey, Tony. How you doing? Good, Sean. How are you, man? Good. Um, I had a question. Um, 
John Moxley recently talked to ESPN about his experience going to rehab for, um, you know, alcohol problems. And um, with your recent statement coming out about Jeff Hardy's suspension after being arrested for a DUI, have you thought about instituting any kind of wellness policy in AEW given some of the recent occurrences? Or is there something in place already that you haven't talked about? I was just wondering if you could shed a little bit. We have a wellness wellness policy, but in a case of drinking, I I think it's you have to be really uh, careful because most people, I think, you know, 99% of the roster has drank really responsibly. And I think most people drink really responsibly, as you see from advertisements on TV and and billboards. That's the number one thing they 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 ask is that people do drink responsibly. It's on the bottom of the ad. But I um no I haven't uh in a, you know thought about that. We have a wellness policy, and as far as testing for alcohol after the shows, uh I think a lot of people would <laughs> drink alcohol after the show's over. And I don't have a policy about that. I think it's I put the other than we ask people to be safe and responsible. Uh, and, and to be honest with you, um, I think they're totally different things. And I think it's comparing apples and oranges when you mention the two things, like they're the same thing. And, uh, I think that one person realized, and I had, that's why I handled them completely differently, Sean. And, uh, they're completely different things. And so I, we have a wellness policy in place and it covers these things, but, that's why we're here to support somebody when they come to me and they say, we have a problem. And in John's case, he went straight to it and jumped on it and checked himself into rehab because he had a problem. And John could not have been more responsible in what he did. And we could not have been more uh, supportive or there for him. I love him so much and having him back here and, and, fighting on this pay-per-view and looking the way he does and, and having his family ha- healthy and happy and where he's at. And the fact that he, now he gets the big match with Tanahashi, he's, a, he's wanted for years. It's, it's like a fairy tale with Jeff. It's totally different. And the way it went down is totally different. And that's why the statements and the way we handled the two things are completely different. And so uh, in this case, like uh, I just don't think there's any comparison for uh, the, the two be honest with you so it's i don't i wouldn't want to comment anymore on it thanks john thanks sean thanks sean as promised mike johnson from pw insider is up next <clears throat> mike will be followed by brandon thurston can i go back can i go back jim can i go back jim is that yeah. okay thanks um jeff is doing much better and i'm i i think I, as i understand jeff's in treatment and I don't want to say too much about what's going on because it's his business and, and, but, but I'm here for him for whatever he needs. I'm really glad nobody got hurt, but what Jeff did going out and driving is totally different from the other thing. And I just don't like hearing the two of them compared, if that makes sense. And I feel like I'd be remiss if I didn't sit, you know, give Jeff a lot of credit for now doing the right thing. And this is how he said, Jeff's got to do the right thing. And, and, and if he wants to stay with AEW, because it's, last chance saloon man and uh you know it's totally different john didn't put anybody at risk like that he wasn't out uh, uh drinking and driving and we never i've never seen any evidence of anything like that and uh certainly uh was it was the way it went down was totally different so that's why i didn't like hearing it compared but i will say jeff is is is, is i is in treatment and and doing better and and i talked to matt about it the other day and and we'll be here and we'll support him for what he needs. And I am that this is what he had to do. He had to go to treatment to get, to get us to keep supporting him uh, at this point. And, and we are. So um, I'm glad you asked, but at the same time, I will, I'm glad to give an update on Jeff, but I just think it's such a different situation that I, I don't want to, you know, compare the two, if that makes sense. So thanks. Sorry about that, Jim. Thanks. No, no, that, that, that was a, uh, that was a good follow-up, Tony. Um, Mike Johnson from PW Insider is next. Brandon Thurston will follow Mike. Brandon is with uh, Russ Nottings. Mike? Hey, Tony. How are you? Hey, I'm well. How are you, man? I'm hanging in there. Um, everyone knows you're a stats guy. Uh, you've got a stats company. You're big on stats, the wins and losses. I'm curious, and I don't know if you have any hard data yet, given all the variables and all the new talents who are involved in Forbidden Door, 
how has this pay-per-view tracked in terms of advanced buys and in terms of advanced retention with the audience compared to some of the other cornerstone AEW shows? Do you see a difference with the different variables? Well, it, most of the stuff is in within 48 hours. So we're actually, we're not yet in within 48 hours of the pay-per-view. So we'll get really, it starts to get really predictive here in the next couple of days. Um, so there's limit in the, you know, limited information 72 hours out but that being said those are the hardcore buyers and we've tracked really well with the hardcore buyers which is kind of what i expected i think this is this pay-per-view is for all wrestling fans i like i said mike and i've known you since i was very young and uh it's crazy to think that like the 90s were that long ago but really you know 27 years ago uh i remember I talked to you about Starcade 95 and that was a big show. And a lot of great wrestlers who are relevant to this day were on Starcade 95 and on the WCW side and also on the new Japan side, there really hasn't been a collaboration like this probably since then with this many wrestlers from a company coming over, that was a cool show. And then you also had, uh, the shows that were probably a little bit closer to what we're doing, which were the collaboration shows like uh, at the Tokyo Dome with uh, Flair versus Fujinami, with Hase and Sasaki versus the Steiners and great matches uh, like that. And then many of the great stars of WCW versus many of the great stars in Japan. Uh, and I think uh, there's a huge market for it in the U.S. and also a huge market for it as we've seen in Japan. Uh, but that was how I got introduced to a lot of the great Japanese wrestling stars. And I was just a young kid and sure I was like a clearly right adapted adaptable to be a hardcore at that age. But, um, there's probably a lot of people that are adaptable to be hardcores. You have to actually make of them fans. And, uh, they did that by presenting good wrestlers in compelling fashion. And then Bill Watts brought in a lot of them for the NWA tournament. And, and they wrestled there through the summer of 92. I enjoyed it a lot. And, uh, you know, Eric Bischoff maintained the relationships with New Japan. And I think Eric Bischoff really took that stuff to another level uh, working with Inoki. And so, uh, yeah, I think for um, a long time, there hasn't been a collaboration on this stage, you know, in, in big sellout arenas. Uh, so, It'll be really interesting to see how it does in with the what the, what they call the casual fan with the, you know the average fan. But it, right now, in seventy two hours out, yeah, it's tracking like an AEW pay per view. You know, the, the test will be as we get closer to it because I think the hardcores were always going to buy this. So uh, you know, was, I think it was really encouraging to see a good audience when Okada showed up uh, with Hangman and Cole and Jay White, and also um, that Will Ospreay's done some good numbers here and has had a bunch of great matches now on TV and people know what to expect from him. And I think people are really excited for Osprey versus orange and Tanahashi built uh, a, a nice following here already. Uh, and I think made a lot of new fans on TV, just like some of the great stars from new Japan when I was a kid and, and, you know, when frankly, when you were a kid, Mike, <laughs> so, uh, um, yeah, uh, that, uh, that, that I think that, you know, that'll, be what we'll find out here in the next 48 to 72 hours. Uh, but, but right now it's tracking really, really strong. But, but, but again, at this, you know, at this point, most the vast, vast majority of the buys will come in the last 48 hours and really in the last 24. Even. Thanks Mike. And I would say that, you know, by the way, the ticket sales speak for themselves. I think one of the greatest predictors of success is it could, how, how does it sell and the, the ticket sales through the roof. For Forbidden Door and uh, and one of the most successful events I've ever been involved in promoting. So uh, it's a live event and as a pay per view, I'm excited to see how it does. So that I hope that makes sense. Thanks, man. Okay, thank you, Mike. Brandon Thurston from WrestleNomics uh, will be next, and Brandon will be followed by our last um, visitor of the day, Jerry Durasmo from Off the Script with JD. Brandon, you're up. Hi, Tony. Thanks for your time today. Hey, thank you, Brandon. I really appreciate it. Thanks for all the insightful work you do. 
Uh, you mentioned a moment ago that AEW has a wellness policy. I was wondering if you could tell us uh, any, anything more about that, if that involves drug testing or any specifics about how talent uh, would, be, would be disciplined or offered help if they violate the Yeah, policy. and, and it, I, I, yes, I'm glad you asked. Uh, I think the most important thing that I will elaborate uh, on is that we're here to help anybody that needs it. And I think, I hope I made it really clear with the, the, the tone I took uh, just now and also with the stern tone I took uh, following Jeff's arrest compared to uh, how I felt and feel about what, how John has stepped up and how he stepped up and got help. Uh, you know, we're here for anybody that steps up and wants to get help and hopefully they'll come to us instead of it being under a circumstance where they get themselves in trouble. But the most important thing is that they get the help and I'm here to stand by anybody that needs help and we'll get it. So I think the, the big point I would note is that every, it's available to anybody here that anybody needs time off. If they have an issue, they can take it no matter how big a star they are. It could be the, the most important person in the company in terms of drawing revenue or somebody who uh, is not on TV as much and doesn't draw as much revenue. It doesn't matter. We're here to get them the same quality of first class treatment if they need it. And, uh, then, you know, as far as everything else, I think, uh, you know, we, we do have policies in place about, uh, you know, ma making sure, uh, people come in and, uh, come show up and, and show up to work, uh, in, in the condition to work. And that's the most important thing. And then, uh, yes, uh, there's, there's a testing policy and in particular, uh, really, uh, I just want to stress that any, we are here to offer help to anybody that needs it, but that I, like I said, hopefully they would come to us and, and not get in trouble and then come to us. Thank you, Brandon. Thanks, and last but not least, Jerry Gerasimo from Off the Script with JD. Jerry, you're taking us home. I'm sorry, Tony. Thank you for having me today, if you guys can hear me. Sure. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Um, with the lines of discussion in the community about Forbidden Door, uh, it's opened up discussion about potentially AEW having more pay-per-views during their calendar years. That's something that you've been mulling over and giving thought to on top of what you have been doing with the core shows that we've gotten and the special dynamites that we've been given, like Grand Slam and the upcoming um, one that you're doing in Minneapolis. It has, has something like that crossed your mind about doing more pay-per-views on top of what you've been given the it has, uh, it has crossed my mind, but I'm not saying it's something we're, we're imminently going to do either. I think it, it would be more revenue for the company. Probably, uh, it, we have great events we built up from the beginning. And I think when we launched, that was the number that made the most sense for us. Uh, because it's a startup company that was truly a bootstrap from the ground up. And now, uh, the company has become something of a global powerhouse uh, available in 130 countries and uh, with a big following. And it took years for us to get to where we were number one on cable. And now we've done it many times and we did it again this week. And it's still a big milestone every time we do it. And it was when we had blood and guts last year, very fitting as we approach blood and guts next Wednesday. And uh, I think, there is definitely the star power in AEW to support more events. They would produce more revenue for the company. Um, I, you know, it's something to consider, uh, but it's not something I've eminently planned to get into either. You know, when, when you when you're flying around and you're not selling at all. Um, it doesn't make sense, but Bret Hart, he had the right psychology, and that guy could put on an incredible performance. It didn't matter how basic the match was. The match still was a five-star match because he was that good.